it's a short paragraph, it's a short reading, so we'll just go through the whole of the chapter rather than just certain verses. 1 Corinthians 13 from verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body up to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And that is the word of the Lord. Let's just have a word of prayer. Speak, Lord, in the stillness, while we wait on thee. Hush our hearts to listen in expectancy. Speak, O blessed Master, in this quiet hour. May we see thy face, Lord, and feel thy touch of power. Amen. Love is a subject that it's very nice to talk about, but it's somewhat harder to put into practice. And in this 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, we have love described. Love is like a prism which breaks light into its component parts. Just as sunshine through mist produces a rainbow, and there is nothing more stunning than a proper rainbow, so the light of God shining his love on our lives should be reflected on to the lives of others. And I trust this evening that the few thoughts that I want to share with you that we will use them as a mirror so that we can see for ourselves how we measure up to this love. The last thing that we should do is, as we go through this study, begin to think, well, that would be good for so-and-so. No. Let's try to concentrate only 
in our own lives. Most of us, if we are going somewhere in the day, be it work or to meet friends or even coming to the church here, we have a look in the mirror before we leave. We might not be too keen on what looks back, but we check that it's looking reasonable. Every day when we open God's Word and we read God's Word, it should be as a mirror to us. And we should be willing, and it happens, doesn't it, when the Lord speaks to us concerning something that needs to be addressed, that we address it before we go any further in that day. Also, as we are encouraged to do these days, we are encouraged to check our physical bodies for lumps or bumps that shouldn't be there. Well, we are encouraged to look with a spiritual view to see if there are things in our lives that really should not be there. Verses 4 through 7 list 16 components of love. And these things can never be imitated by merely a natural man. These things can only be seen in the lives of believers who their whole existence is open to the work and ministry of the Spirit of God. The section of Scripture reads, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Firstly, love is patient. Four different statements are made concerning this love. We are told that it suffers long or is long-tempered, it forbears for long periods, and this means that there is absolutely no place in our lives for impatience. Is that straightforward? No, it's not. Because I'm sure almost all of us at some point in the past week have been unnecessarily impatient. Love willingly endures. It is not heavy, but calm. It is almost ready to work when the summons to work comes. We learn also that it bears all things. There's no limit to its endurance. It overlooks the faults in others. And it doesn't complain. It doesn't expose its grief and tears, but obscures, obscures them from others. It knows when to be silent. It knows how to avoid resentment. It knows how to endure hurt and sorrow without divulging it to the world. Selfishness may prompt the believer to give in to their feelings under hardship, but love enables them to endure patiently. But then also, it hopes all things. It hopes under all kinds of circumstances, 
It is optimistic, not gloomy. It doesn't look in the dark side of life, neither does it give in easily to despair and despondency. Anxiety doesn't affect it. When true love is present, all personal woes go. It endures all things. A mother's love for their child illustrates this very, very well. Mothers go to great lengths to nourish and protect their children. Dads do it too. I remember as a child, I was very ill for, for a long time. I was in and out of York Hill for a good number of months. Right up till I hit my teens, my general health was hopeless. I had really bad asthma and there was a lot of absences from school, etc. And I look back and I remember even as a wee boy, the, the limits and, and the lengths that my mom would go to make sure I was looked after. I remember once she was particularly unwell herself. And yet she insisted in walking to the chemist, which was not just round the corner, so that my prescription could be picked up. And that stuck with me. I was probably about nine at the time. The love that we should show is love along these kinds of lines, but much more powerful and much more potent. You see, love stands its ground when it seems that there is very little reason for hope. It endures when believers are persecuted for what they've done. Now, thankfully, we have not had to endure that so far. And so we have very little understanding of what that means. But having the privilege to have been in Eastern Europe a few times, I've heard quite horrific stories of people who were tortured relentlessly, but they refused to give up their faith. How do we measure up then with that kind of love? We're told that it's kind. It looks for ways to be constructive rather than destructive. It leaves no room for unkindness. It's always gentle. It confers blessings and not condemnation to others. It seeks to do good, not only to our fellow believers, but to all men and women, and not hard work. It actively seeks the happiness of others. We live in a me first world, don't we? Have done for a while now. Some people would go to any lengths as long as they climb the tree. Now that's not to be how we live. The best example that we can follow is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. It makes no distinction among people, color of skin, race, etc. In the midst of sorrow, It brings joy. And I'm sure many of you have been in circumstances where for the unsaved there, there would be no, no hope, there would be nothing to look forward to. I think of the loss of my mum during COVID. But it wasn't lost really. Because she is somewhere far better. 
And even in the midst of, of losing the, the physical presence of her, there was the joy that she was with the Lord and that we would be with him one day also. Sadly, we are prone to live under the domination of our fallen nature. From time to time, we know the battle, the, the scriptures speak of it very clearly, between the old self and the new self. And it is a battle. If anyone who tells you otherwise, you have my authority to tell them they're wrong. Because it matters which of the natures we cater for as to whether we will produce the fruit of the Spirit, of which love is one of the aspects of it, or whether we are just a pain in the backside. Love is also generous. It never boils over with jealousy. It's not possessive like a child who wants to think that everything belongs to them and them alone. I remember my cousins when we were younger used to stay just around the corner from us in Coatbridge and they used to come round and steal my cars. So when I knew they were coming I would put all the bad ones out. <coughs> the ones that were chipped and missing a wheel and they could take them if they liked but they weren't taking some of my good ones. I was going to hold on to them. Love seeks the advantage of others rather than themselves. It teaches us to treat others better than we do ourselves. We learn not to count anything as only ours, but we realise that all that we have, everything, belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are not to envy others for the work that they may be doing for the Lord. We may think it's bigger than what we are doing or it looks more exciting than what we are doing. No, we are to rejoice at their success. Now here's a very obvious one, but one that we trip up over Love is helpful. Does not boast about itself. It's not puffed up. Humility seals our lips and causes us to forget the things that we feel we really should say to someone because of what they said about us. It teaches us to do deeds of kindness. Not to parade them so that we get the glory, but to do them and forget that we've done them at all. Love never boasts, it never brags. Doesn't show off its gifts. It's not out for display. Doesn't try to impress others. Not self-assertive doesn't seek that special place for itself or to push itself forward. The outward expression of love is that everything we do is done with humility. Everything. Inwardly, not puffed up, doesn't show arrogance, not conceited, doesn't cherish its own ideals or its own importance. It's teachable. Isn't that the hard one? It's teachable. Because very often we think we know it all. And it's our place to impart our knowledge to others. And not vice versa. Doesn't cherish overinflated 
attitudes concerning self. Then it's courteous, doesn't behave rudely. Now, this is true in relationship to society today, small things, great things. The most untutored person moving in the highest society with such love in their heart will behave himself or herself without show. It's love that makes the true lady or gentleman of a believer. It makes sure that what is done is not done inconsiderately or unsympathetically. Love produces good and noble manners and it's never rude. But then, love is not selfish. It doesn't seek its own good or insist in its own rights. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We are to reckon ourselves to be dead to the old self-nature. Dead to it. And for that reason, we will not insist on our own way. No hint of self-seeking. No selfishness. Because those two things, when they are out of control, are the basis of almost all evil actions. But love does not seek even what it owns. It gives up its rights for the benefit and the blessing of others. Jeremiah 45 verse 5 says this, Do you seek great things for yourself? The answer? Seek them not. Not even a wee bit? No. None of it. Greatness lies in unselfish love. It's not in things or in positions. It's more difficult to give up rights which we have sought after. But they must be surrendered. Happiness is not to do with with having or getting, but giving. Not, not just money, everything, time, talents, strength. Someone needs a hand with something that they are unable to do due to their own weakness or whatever, we should be willing to go and say, here we are do so gladly. The Lord said, Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. That's true love. Then the one that uh, caught me all too often in my younger years, love has a good temper. Not easily provoked to anger, not touchy or irritable. Love should refuse to take offence. Does not dwell on having suffered wrong from others. Anger and wrath are not elements of this love, neither is bitterness. These things eat away our Christian experience and indeed our witness. The person who is controlled by the love of Christ is not a better person, but a gracious person. Just as a spark would fall into the water and be extinguished immediately, so bitterness 
and anger and whatever else is extinguished in the ocean of God's love. Any evil falling from that heart will be extinguished before it can harm. Society speaks of a bad temper as a mere human weakness. It's an infirmity of our nature, so the philosophers would tell us. A person who is e easily angered or one who is quick-tempered hurts themselves. I know. For the simple fact that I was at the receiving end of my mother's slipper frequently. But seriously, though, if these things, if we cherish them and we, we nurture them, they will destroy us. And we will suffer. A quick temper leaves, well, one unguarded when the opposite should be true. This love is not a subject that is debatable. This is not a multiple choice question paper where we tick what we think we like or not. All of these so far should be evident in our life. If there is a quick temper, such a disposition can ruin family homes, church life, society, and national life. Prominent men who have uncontrolled tempers are in many respects just babies. And I would think that an uncontrolled temper is probably harder to live with than any other characteristic. Because it is the symptom of an unloving nature. One unguarded, hasty, warped moment can destroy friendships. I remember many years ago now being invited to go to Switzerland with a group of, uh, of young people from Glasgow. And the plan was that in the evenings I would do some Bible teaching and during the day we would do whatever else. And I can't remember what happened, but I do remember at one point, quite frankly, I lost it. And it utterly destroyed a friendship. I've never seen Phil since. Never heard from him. In an unguarded moment, bad temper. But then love thinks no evil. It's the real thing. When a person attributes no evil motives to another but assumes the best motives for the other person's actions, then we're beginning to show love. Doesn't harbour evil thoughts not suspicious about what other people are doing or thinking, doesn't remember past injuries. That was what this morning was all about, if you remember. Parking past problems and difficulties, moving on. It doesn't take into account wrong that is suffered, bears no malice, is not resentful, and let me tell you, this is hard. Because we're human, and we're still in that battle spiritually. But that is never an excuse to show a lack of love. I'll give you one illustration of where the temperature of any church's love 
is seen. Tuesday night come. Christmas Eve. Wow. Then you see who is walking with true Christian love and those who are not. Now what I'm saying is it's not wrong to disagree. It's the manner of the disagreeing, disagreement <coughs> that counts. Love believes all things. It doesn't do things that will destroy trustful fellowship. It has confidence in others. It doesn't stand critical or give unkind judgment attributing to other folks that may not be there of what is said we are very good at exaggerating and we add a wee bit on to the story it appreciates the good that it finds in others it takes the kindest possible view with regards to what other people are doing the opposite, opposite of slander and gossip and smearing of character. And that's very prevalent in society, but also in the church. One of the most difficult lessons that Joe had to learn was that Christians can sometimes be heartless and dish out hurt. Then, finally, love is sincere. Doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Now, this is not just about rejoicing over what the Bible teaches. That's, that's part of it. <coughs> but it means that a person seeks to get to the bottom of the facts regarding Bible teaching and also regarding circumstances and situations that are otherwise in our lives. It seeks truth with a humbleness of heart, with an unbiased mind that doesn't seek to capitalise on the faults of others. It doesn't delight in showing someone else's weakness. It covers a multitude of sins. And love is glad when good is done. How many times now, before I even say this, I'll put my hand up and I'm not asking any of you to do this. How many times have you secretly gloated when it seems that someone is getting a dose of their own medicine? Read hot. See? After all they've dished out, I'm glad they're struggling because they deserve it because, and so the story goes, is that demonstrating love? No. Not at all. Job provides an excellent illustration with his friends, or so-called friends, who accused him of harbouring wrong and said that, well, that's the reason, son, why are you, you're suffering? True love never does that. Never judges. Is always glad to show God's mercy. There is one situation that sometimes we get wrong as believers, and that is when some believer that we know, it may be someone in the fellowship, it may be in the family, and they backslide. And they make their way back, and we decide that we're going to be judge and jury. Is that showing love? No. Love never fails. 
but all else fails, love remains. The great fact for the Christian to grasp is that the love of God has been shared abroad in their hearts by the Holy Spirit. In fact, the opening words of chapter 14 state that the Christian is to follow after love, to desire spiritual gifts, etc. But we're to do it all loving one another. The gifts of the Spirit without the grace of the Spirit are ineffective in providing spiritual help to others. So, as we bring this to a conclusion, we have to ask ourselves, and trust me, I've asked myself these questions and at times wasn't overly thrilled with some of the answers. Is this type of love being practiced in my life? If not, why not? If our hearts are not filled with love, it's because we are not filled with or controlled by the Holy Spirit. And what we need to do is to surrender ourselves entirely to the Spirit of God and immediately folks say, oh, what's going to be said now? Nothing. Each of us, every moment of every day, should be being filled with the Spirit of God. We shouldn't be relying on blessings that we knew six months ago. Our lives, and it's one of the best illustrations that I can find, should be like a, a glass that is sat under a running tap. It's never empty, and it's always fresh water. That's what our life should be with regards to the filling of the Holy Spirit. And as we are filled with the Spirit, we are willing to surrender our lives in total, Sometimes we complain about seeing so little fruit for our service. Is that God's fault? No. Not at all. We are not promised that we will always see fruit for our labours. But equally, sometimes a lack of fruit is down to the fact there is a lack of love. For believers and indeed for those out there. Class of girls, wee girls were learning how to spell and they were spelling a number of words. Some animals, pig, cat, dog, cow, using them to themselves by making the sounds that these animals would make. One of the wee girls was called Joy. And she was asked to spell the word love. And she thought for a moment, she got up and she walked past the blackboard, went to the teacher's desk, threw her arms around the teacher and kissed her on the cheek. And having done that, she said, this is how we spell love in my house. The rest of the class began to laugh. But the teacher stopped them. And she asked Joy another question, and she said, that was beautiful, but do you know any other ways of spelling love, kind of holding the chalk? Oh yes, she said. And she began to tidy the teacher's desk, and she said, that's another way of we spell love <coughs> in our home. The young man spent an entire evening telling his, this girl how much he loved her. Well, he couldn't live without her. He would go to the ends of the earth for her. 
He would even die for it. However, in leaving, he said, I'll see you tomorrow night if it doesn't rain. How often we say we love God yet deny it in our actions. Christ will give the crown of life only to those, well, firstly, who love him. But then, love others. Let's pray. Father God, we are privileged people. We have received the greatest love known to man. We have benefited from it. We have an eternal future because of it. But Lord, help us to demonstrate this love, however difficult it is, even though it goes against our old nature. Help us in all that we do, in all our dealings with those who are believers, with our families, with society in whom we meet. May we reach out and show love to those who have no idea about the love of God. And wouldn't know where to start. Help us to be the vessels where that can begin to happen. And so we pray for your help. At the start of this, another new week. That we'll go forth. That we'll be what we should be. And in doing that, we will give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honour. We thank you for today. We thank you for the times that we've been able to spend in this manner. What a privilege it is. We think of those even tonight who, who don't have this privilege, who are fearful. But we do pray, O oh God, that as we would be filled with the Spirit on a daily basis, that this aspect of the fruit of the Spirit would be evident beyond measure in our lives for your glory and for the benefit and blessing of others. We ask it in Jesus' name.